Hey, you'll have to, I hate to say this, but you have to start that all over again, just to be on the safe side. <clears throat> All right, as a preliminary matter, this is Janet Schulte, Director of Culture and Tourism. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. When I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Sharon Quigley. Here. Liz Holland. Here. Peter Morrison. Here. Matt Peel. Here. Mary Malavase. Here. Clara Boyce. Here. And staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. David Sharp. Here. And Janet Chilty is here. Good morning. This open meeting of the Visitor Services Advisory Committee is being conducted remotely pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will not feature public comment. For this meeting, the committee is convening by video conference via Zoom app as posted on the town's website identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that all attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and to take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website, unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda, unless the chair or the vice chair notes otherwise. <clears throat> We are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate minutes. The chair will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in conversation with other members, please do so through the chair. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. I turn it back to you, Mary. Thank you, Janet. Um, everyone received the packet of information from David with the uh, agenda and the supporting materials. First item on the agenda today is the approval of two sets of minutes first being June 8th, and the second being July 27th. I mean, everyone's had a chance to read and review these minutes. Um, I think I'll take them separately. So the first one is the set of June 8th. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved by Peter. Second. Second. Any discussion on the motion? Then I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any, Aye. Oppo any opposed? And no abstentions. Thank you. Second set of minutes is July 27. They're again provided by David. Um, can I have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved by Peter. Second. Second. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, we'll call to vote. You can all signify by um, all in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Unnoted and no abstentions. Thank you very much. Okay, moving along. Next item uh, is the election of officers for the term of 2021 and 22. Janet. We have discussion? two positions, two officer positions, chair and vice chair. Josh has indicated, even though he can't be present today, that he would be willing to serve as chair. And we'll take any other nominations and self nominations for that position. Okay, hearing none, I will suggest that we approve Josh as chair for the period of 21 into 22 term. <laughs> Can I have a motion to approve that, Officer Slate? So moved by Peter. Okay, second. Okay. Um, any other discussion on that motion? If so, I'd like to call a vote that we will appoint Josh as chair for the upcoming year. You should do that by roll call. Okay. Roll call, I will call you individually and please indicate your um, 
Affirmative or objection? Liz Holland? Affirmative. Peter Morrison? Affirmative. Sarah Boys? Affirmative. Matt Peel? Affirmative. Sharon Quigley? Affirmative. And I, Mary Malavase, yes. Hearing no objections, that motion and appointment is approved by unanimous vote. And we okay. have the position of vice chair. Mary, would you like to serve again? I'd be happy to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, sure. Um, I, I would be happy to. I think this is a little awkward though, putting my name in nomination. Um, but I, I would continue the term. Like to that nominate I've Mary had. as vice chair. Thank you, Sharon. I was waiting for that. Um, I second the nomination. <laughs> okay. Any other discussion uh, on the nomination? Okay, we'll call for another roll call vote. Liz Holland? Approved. Peter Morrison? Approved. Sarah Boyce? Approved. Matt Peel? Approved. Sharon Quigley? Uh, approved. All right, um, majority has approved that and um, I accept the position for the term 2021 to 22. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda is a review of the annual report. Janet, is this a report that goes in the annual book that we get at town meeting? Yes. Okay. Um, a year and a half old by the time people read it. Yeah, exactly. That's why I asked if it was still in the book. <laughs> um, I, I think it was um, pretty comprehensive. Obviously, Josh um, signs it as chair, and it does go into the um, town report. Is there any discussion on what we received? Any additions or subtractions? Okay. Hearing none, then I will make a motion to approve the recommendation for the Visitor Services Advisory Committee report that goes in the annual town report. Janet, does this have to be taken by roll call as well? Uh, yes, it's good. Okay. Um, Okay, roll call vote on this. Liz Holland. Approved. Peter Morrison. Approved. Sarah Boyce. Approved. Matt Peel. Approved. Sharon Quigley. Approved. And I uh, approve as well. Please have a minute to note that it was accepted by unanimous vote. Okay. Moving along, item number five on the agenda is a conversation about updating July 4th activities for 2022. <laughs> I'm going to defer to Janet and David to help us on this. I'll give you a little background. This is part of the continuing discussion that we had in July when we had three meetings about large scale events. <clears throat> we've since had an internal discussion about them and we've been, it's been suggested that we consider uh, modifying the 4th of July activities in light of COVID and also in light of public safety and public health. There's some concern that the event on Main Street has gotten too large um, and that the firefight has gotten to be dangerous. So we would like to entertain thoughts that you all might have that we might take back to the internal discussion about how we might be modifying 4th of July. And it's not too old to be thinking about it because we really need to be planning now for what we might be doing later. Let me give a little background, a little more background first though. We do the Main Street activities in the morning. We've done beach games in the afternoon and then we have fireworks um, in the evening. And we have got a new fireworks contract with the date of July 4th as the initial date for fireworks. So um, that's in place uh, for, for 2022. So what we're really talking about are the Main Street activities and maybe the children's beach activities. And Sharon, I saw your hand up. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not as familiar with what's been going on. I know the Main Street activities, but um, for the competitive thing between the police and the fire department, have they ever done a tug of war? Is that something they do on the beach? Those are two fire, one's, a, one's the fire department. One's the police. Of the other is a group called, I'm gonna to toss it to David. It's the Boynton Lane Reserves. <laughs> okay, so it's volunteer versus paid. Sort of, it's a All local right. group that, Flint Ranny, Rob Ranny's father started this thing years ago and they've just carried it on. Got it. Um, so my thought was, I mean, on the beach, like a, a tug of war that doesn't, I, I think that would be fun to watch. 
um, it still would have that competitive feel that they're looking for. So um, that was just something that popped into my mind. Sarah. Yeah, I just, um, if I remember correctly too, some of the other activities that are usually on Main Street, is this when there's like the pie eating contest and watermelon and, or those kinds of things? Because I was thinking um, those competition things, those things that people love to do that, could either, one suggestion might be to move that off site and have some, or have some things that actually still occur on Main Street because people are still going to congregate there, but have like kind of separate the activities. Um, I don't know if that divides too much, but um, like something like the pie eating con or I, I can't remember if it's pie or watermelon, but <laughs> what, both. 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 okay. So those, those kinds of activities that don't involve water that are um, like people might go specifically for those could be part of the children's beach um, festivities. There's more space there potentially. Um, I haven't been involved in like running them, running them or anything, but just thinking of um, ways to kind of still have the same activities that people really enjoy and, and maybe, maybe they like do them every year as a family or something like that, but kind of separate them out. Are there other activities like that that aren't water related that usually happen on Main Street? Well, the water fight yeah. doesn't start until 10 minutes to noon or right at noon. And mm -hmm. so between 10 and 12, we have, <clears throat> have had face painting, a tea toss, the Matt B. Tea Toss puppet show, a photo booth, um, a water a dunk tank, then the two eating contests. Jan, and I, Jan, I have a question. Is, is, is there a concern about the numbers of people congregating together? That, that they're concerned about the safety of the numbers? I, I think so. I mean, there has been talk prior to 2020 about having large trucks blocking entryways to Main Street in order to you know, defer any kind of idiot driving into a crowd. So we've been talking public safety down there for a while. Could I make a comment? This is Peter. Um, rather than kind of go through the activities, uh, I'm wondering if we ought to start out with a, a framework. And the framework that I'm kind of thinking about is um, we are concerned about <clears throat> public safety and health. <clears throat> and I'm not sure that we're completely aware or fully aware of what the impact on public safety might be of any given activity. So I'm wondering whether why don't we I, um, the police chief and the fire chief and say, which of these activities impinges on your, your, your responsibilities and which ones impinge hinge in a way that really stress them and if so how it may be that public safety is not a staffing problem having enough officers which is the first thing that comes to my <laughs> mind but not having a truck someplace where it always has been and kind of just say what is it that you'd like changed about this or is it something that really just if we were to put it on a, a top candidate to eliminate it uh, it would greatly relieve the stress on you, recognizing that we don't want to cut too many things. And then secondly, just say, well, if we took one out, is there something that we can dream up that might be as much fun, but doesn't involve the police and fire at all or something else? This way we can kind of um, reinvent what's going on rather than kind of curtail it and also optimize it in terms of the efficiency, which in my, in, in my view is that police, the police department is the one that's really stressed and they're not able to hire any more staff. So, I mean, they, they can't get people. So we need to be sensitive to that immediately. Can I ask a question? Sharon. Um, so, uh, Peter, I agree with everything you just said. I think it would be helpful to hear from them what where the pain points of the event so that we can focus on those specific. But I think from what I understood, one of the pain points was the water fight. It was got, it got dangerous, the road was slippery. And so I think 
um, as I understand it, and Janet and David, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that was a big highlight that people came to watch. And I think if, you know, without the other list of issues that the fire department is concerned about, which I'm sure there are many, um, I think that's one thing that there that we could advise on on, on some other fun big finale like yeah. the the fire the, the water fight was it is am i right that that's what we want to try and replace yeah i mean it's uh, there's something about the water fight that sounds really exciting i've never been involved in it but <laughs> i would just say you know <laughs> to the police chief and we don't have to have a meeting just say you know what is it about this water fight that really drives you crazy and he he may say there's only one thing this is it or everything it's a whole, you know, the context. And if it's the context, we say, well, that would be a candidate to replace with something that doesn't have all those attributes. That's where the creative thinking comes in. Um, I just think if we just sort of, you know, we need to identify how to make this really work for the parts of the town that are stressed. And I, I don't have any familiarity. I'm just thinking it's, we need to have the chief sit at his desk and go down the list and say, I'll tell you in two sentences what I don't like about each of these things and I'll email it to you. <laughs> that's all I wanna hear. Well, and that's the conversation that we're having internally is talking about these different yeah. elements. And they've asked me to bring feedback back from this group. I think okay. one of the big issues is the cobblestones themselves, whether they're dry or wet, they're just not safe and that somebody hasn't fallen and busted their head open yet is only a miracle of God. Well, there you go. Wet cobblestones, we dry cannot cobblestones. tolerate. Dry cobblestones. Even <laughs> dry ones are okay, but wet, wet is much worse. Okay, so in other words, don't, don't do it where there are cobblestones. Have your advice yeah. somewhere else. I mean, it yeah. leads to a solution. Sarah? Thank you. Yeah, um, I think one of the, I think everything Peter said was, was really great about getting the input. And Jana, as you said, you're doing that internally already. Um, and I think what, whatever the police chief says if, um, or the fire chief says. But one thing I keep thinking about is um, kind of, even if we do still have some version of a water fight, but really separating those activities. So I know I'm, I'm new to this committee, but as a parent, I've gone down to the water fight. And when my son was small, we only went once and we never went again because he, it was too much. Like, so if someone goes down and they don't, and they want to do the other activities, you either have to hightail it out of there before noon. Um, and it's not its not necessarily the sanctioned activity. It's not like this is the water fight and we've made the water fight safer. Because if you're a bunch of kids or families that are going for the water fight, like that, um, it already creates like a bigger thing than, than what you anticipate. So, I mean, I'm just sharing my experiences of like going to have, like walking downtown to go to the water fight and people had wagons of water balloons. And so I know we've like curtailed water <laughs> balloons in the past, but people like you go for the water fight, right? And so there's sort of a um, no holding back from the other participants, not the fire department squirting the water and, and that kind of stuff, but like there's kids everywhere with water guns and stuff. And that's the fun part, right? So mm -hmm. maybe if, if the if the water fight is something that people do want to continue, um, and I'm not advocating one way or the other, but just having that be at a separate location because of the cobblestones. I mean, I think like older individuals are really young kids. It's hard to participate in any way because there's, <laughs> there's like, it's like too much going on. It's, it is a danger. Um, and, uh, and I was thinking the other part of, of the um, visitor of the, of the downtown piece that is beloved is decorating the bike and the like you know parade up um the kids parade of decorating their bikes and things and that's a real younger activity right and so i mean i don't know if that one has moved yet um to children's speech but just thinking about that that water fight piece is that um that's what i've heard from general community members is um you know when it started fewer people you know, there were, I mean, July's always been the busiest time, but there weren't as many people as there are now. So now it's just so many people coming down um, to the main street in one time and hitting each other with water balloons. It gets really kind of scary for little kids. Oh, I, I, I. Liz? Um, how many 
because I've been a little busy <laughs> the past few past years. <laughs> how many people actually do we have an estimation of how many people actually end up on Main Street for these uh, for you know the whole bash? And then the other thing is is that if we're so you know the the, the chief seems very interested in utilizing Tom Nevers maybe because anybody that's on Main Street when the water fight happens is involved whether they want to be or not. Maybe, you know, and I'm not saying yes or that this is a great idea or not, but move the water fight out to Tom Nevers where there's plenty of open space, there's plenty of parking and have it like build something out there that is, you know, separate from what's happening on Main Street. So and anyway, an absence an of idea. I'm sorry. And there's an absence of cobblestones. I mean, it's yes, you know, the, right. That's what I was thinking. And the okay. a different venue becomes the solution for some of these things. Yeah. yeah, as long as we have adequate transportation to get the visitors there, that's a whole other issue. I think the reason it's always been in town is it was close to all the inns and the hotels and the boats, and you know, and and we we have one of the best main streets in the country, so you know, why not use it? Um, obviously, I've gone to it for years and years. I mean, literally 40 some odd years of water fight when Flint first started it. Um, and obviously, the numbers have grown. There's, there's no doubt about it. And, and I think it's grown because we're a victim of our own success. People see it as fun, unique, doesn't happen in their hometown so that they want to be part of it. You know, and kids for generations talk about it. So, you know, I'm, I, I don't really think we should cancel all of the events. I think we just need to make sure they're safe because our numbers aren't what they were 30 years ago. That's for sure. David, do you have a sense of how many people are on Main Street? At the um, I would say 3,000, um, maybe five at the most, depending on you know the time of day. Um, but I think the average is three, 3,000. Yeah, I mean, if, if you've never been there, you can't even see the cobblestones. There are so many people, you know, it, it, it's like some of the original stroll, you know, sing-alongs, uh, you know, when we did carols. So uh, there again, great weather, lots of people, a family event. So I think we need to encourage family events, but we probably might have to rethink how we do it. That's how to stand up. Yeah, Matt, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of agree with what Liz and like Sarah were saying. Um, you know, I would even put out there like Children's or Jetty's Beach. I think this would be a great place in Jetty's Beach as well. Uh, or a great activity to do this out there and kind of spill out into the beach as well. Uh, but also, I think one thing worth looking at too is what about putting some sort of an age limit on it as well or encouraging an age limit for the water fight? Uh, you know, maybe like over either on the higher end or on the lower end, you know, I think on the lower end from smaller kids are separating and kind of having almost two water fights because having a four year old, you know, oh, and then seeing a bunch of 16 year olds running around squirting and throwing balloons. I mean, a four year old gets hit in the face with water, balloons. it's, it's going to hurt. And so I, mean, I think that's something kind of look at as well. It's, is maybe possibly kind of looking at age ranges and either separating age ranges or encouraging, you know, parents to bring down kids that are like eight and under or something like that to keep it more of a younger kid's activity. I don't know how one would enforce an age limit on Main Street in the middle of a water fight. It, it took us two full years to get rid of the water balloons and there's no guarantee that they're gone forever because that's the biggest yeah. environmental nightmare that that event creates. I think I'm gonna be pretty blunt here and say, I don't think we're gonna see a water fight again anywhere. <laughs> I think Sharon's idea about a tug of war is an interesting one. Um, I can't wait to see the mud pit that they're gonna get pulled into. <laughs> but the chief, fire chief has been a pretty wet clear. Sand pit. Yeah. yeah. The fire chief has been pretty clear that that water fight in his opinion is too dangerous no matter where it is, for it to continue. Well, that weighs pretty heavily on me. Uh, I mean, I, I think we really have to give serious, you know, weight to what the chiefs say. 
because I, I agree, you know, we're, we, we have been lucky not to have incurred a terrible public affairs nightmare with these things going on. When I, when I hear three to 5,000 people and cobblestones and water, I, it, I agree. And, and I just think we have to, we have to try to reimagine them and say, could we, could we relabel it? The children's water fight held at Tom Nevers reimagined and you know it, it's going to cut back on a lot of people's fun but it's going to continue a tradition and it's going to keep it going i'm not saying that that's what we should do but i'm just saying we have to approach it with the key thing in mind which is we need to make it safer sharon yeah i um i think the thing that strikes me about the water fight or any of those water events is that I, I don't think it's so much for our guests, maybe for some our summer residents who come year after year, they're prepared for it. But based on my experience in the hotel, I think a lot of tourists aren't necessarily prepared to do it. And it drives them out of Main Street when it happens because it's dangerous and overwhelming. Um, I've been there and I've just, I tailed it out because I didn't like it and I didn't have a water gun. Um, I don't know, someone can weigh in and tell me that tourists are, aside from summer people who probably are, are familiar with it, won't come back. Um, but I also like the idea of having the junior version of the water fight at Children's Beach on the grass or on the sand and you know, promoting it as a children's activity under 12 come to the children's water fight or something. And that's a lot easier to, to police. It's a small area coming in. It's a small grassy area. You could see everyone. So we could try and enforce a younger, no water balloon, no 16 year olds at children's beach. Now it may tear up a lawn. Um, so the town may not like it, but I think that might, that might be an e a compromise. It's the 30 year olds that I worry about at the water fight. Yeah, yeah. Well, we can we can definitely I, see. I think the I think the problem with Main Street is there's so many avenues in and it's so big. But at Children's Beach, it's a very contained area and it's pretty easy to see an adult in that grassy area and say, look, you don't belong here. Get out. This is a kid's event. That's a nice it's a nice generic solution because when you relabel it a children's something event uh, in their mid 20s from coming to it because they say well this is just for children we say we're sorry we had to deep six this activity for your generation but we're keeping it alive for another one and that, that's this is the kind of thing where I think you can invent a solution that is generic. If you make some of the worst things just for children in another place, you keep it alive and you solve the police chiefs and the fire chiefs problem. I, I just have a clarification and I need help on this. In my opinion, the kids don't participate in a water fight. They're more observers of what some adults are doing. So I think that's, you know, to think that, you know, kids are out there running around with hoses, you know, is, is not my experience. So Mary, I think that was the original and that's what's been going on. But in my experience of going a couple of times was it's morphed into everyone, you know, no one has hoses like the that I've seen, but lots of people bring their own stuff and especially like the higher end water guns are quite forceful. And then obviously, as Janet was saying, the, the water balloons, taking those out of the mix, I think really solved a lot yeah. of issues. <laughs> but I think um, it's the the volume of people. So everyone bringing their own things. And it's like the parents of the younger kids, some of them get, like I think Janet, you said like the 30 year olds. It's not, it, I think it's just so many people, right? And at all ages. So Usually if you're like at children's speech and there's something going on, you can kind of be on the perimeter and watch if you're like, I don't feel so comfortable participating. But as Sharon was saying, there's so many entry points for Main Street. 
it was hard. It's hard to be out of the mix. Like it's hard to be like, okay, well, I'm just going to be like up at this little storefront and I'll stand on the stairs and watch the festivities, but you're just part of it if you're on Main Street at all. So, so that just reinforces the location that may not be yeah. the proper venue. Um, I, I will say if you've ever stood next to Janet on Main Street during the water balloon discussion, um, it was pretty forceful a couple of years ago, and those kids were sent packing with their, you know, wagon full of water balloons once Janet saw them. I made so, them cry. Yes, you did. Yeah, you did. Um, and uh, I, I, I can attest to that. Um, but I think, you know, the education has started. I mean, we, you know, I know in the real estate world, we sent out all sorts of notices to all of our, you know, visitors and said, no, no water balloons, no guns, no, you know, n n nothing. You're there to observe. So, um, you know, I think it was started and it was successful as a campaign. And then, of course, everything has been on a hiatus. Um, so I think that has kind of been reinforced. David, did you have a comment? Yeah, I, I just want to make sure everybody not lose sight that the <clears throat> intent of the water fight is the actual water fight between the trucks, the fire trucks, that they actually hook up the hoses and they, you know, spray the hoses on, at each other. And then when they're done, it becomes a free for all with uh, all the kids and all the adults trying to use their water balloons and water guns and running around and, and everybody gets involved somehow if they're within that you know, not just Main Street, but the side streets, the block on either side, you know, from away from uh, Main Street, there are people running around with, with, um, you know, water guns and all that stuff. So it, it becomes crazy after, after the fire uh, department's all finished up there. And then just winds down. So you see, we come up with uh, two dimensions here. We tell the police, and the fire chief, uh, we've got two ways of going about this, relocate and re, uh, redefine by age cohort. <laughs> so we wanna scale everything, we wanna scale an event down by giving it a, a name that says children's inst instead of everyone's, put it in a different place, and then just ask them whether they think these ideas would work and what they'd suggest as venues. And, you know, I, I, I'm starting to think that this is like a giant fraternity house where you say, if you put the wrong name on it, none of the people who you really don't want in will try to attend and everyone else will sort themselves out. Okay, Janet, uh, Matt, go ahead. Um, Another suggestion I was just thinking about as well, what about reaching out to the group that runs the, the town fair, the fall fair out at Tom Nevers and saying, what activities can we come up with as well that you use successfully out there that we can kind of translate into the 4th of July, kind of go back to an old school kind of fair, you know, like, like you mentioned, let's mention like the piety contest, the tug of war, just kind of do some good old fashioned, just fun, you know, a bet, because I kind of think that's almost kind of old school Nantucket, just kind of good old fashioned, you know, traditional type events. And, and I, you know, then they could kind of get some double coverage on the, the fall fair as well, you know, do some promotion for the fall fair, get some more exposure for that. Just thought. Sounds good. I like it. Okay. Janet. Um... How would you like us to proceed? Do you want recommendations? Do you want us to send in comments? Or do we have enough to so go back to the each chief? I think I've got enough to take back to the internal discussion. Um, and then I can come back after that and report to you about what it is we're thinking about doing on the staff level. I think the, you know, the relocation idea and the attempt to redefine by age group might fly. Um, I think it would gonna be some kind of competitive activity that doesn't involve hoses or water and probably not food eating contest, um, but we'll see. Okay, any other comments for Janet? Write down these words, old fashioned children's name of event. Hmm. Yeah, we, we may not be able to do face painting anymore either, so. <laughs> 
Um, okay, moving along. Um, director's report. I'm happy to let you know that the Nantucket Cultural District received uh, its five-year redesignation at the Mass Cultural Council's board meeting in August. And in doing that, we proposed extending the boundaries of the district to include the Museum of African American History and Egan Institute by virtue of the links and the shipwreck shuttle operating within the boundaries. So we were able to expand it and increase the diversity that's present and represented in the district partners. There are now 19 district partners. I sent a press release around yesterday. So I'm hoping something comes out about that. Along the same lines about the cultural district, the executive director of the Mass Cultural Council was here in July and several members of the cultural community met with him, Michael Bobbitt. We had a great conversation about uh, diversity funding, uh, the challenges of working with Mass Cultural Council. And he's already working hard to uh, redo some of the programs that they have there because we were spending an hour or so maybe two hours to write a grant for $300. And it's just not worth my time to write a grant. I'd rather write a check than a grant for $300. Um, I'm working with the INM, Inc. Inquirer and Mayor on the Halloween parade, or uh, David and I are. And we're looking for volunteers to help hand out candy to that, uh, on that day, it's October 31st in the afternoon. Instead of going in the Methodist Church, we'll be outside of it. And we're gonna still have the costume contest uh, but that's probably going to be down at the other end of Main Street. So we're going to try to spread the events out a little bit more than we have. I've been having conversations about outdoor dining, and I'd like to bring Amy Baxter to this meeting next month to talk about some of the things that she's thinking about for outdoor dining moving forward. Uh, in August, we had a dedication of the Arthur Cooper Memorial and at the corner of Angola Park and New Mill Street, or North Mill Street, uh, there's a stone there that commemorates Mr. Cooper, who was a what they call self-emancipated slave uh, and lived quite a life here on Nantucket. And there's a plaque there dedicated to him now that says that. I'm also working on a strategic planning update because I, I participated in that at the cabinet level, uh, preparing that for the select board for October. And we should be getting our budget instructions next week. So I might have some news about what the budget's going to look like for next year at that point. Uh, so that's my report for this month. Anybody got any questions? I think it's great about the cultural district again. They, they realize how hard you and everyone else have been working out here to keep that designation. So, who goes? Okay. David? Hello. Hi. Thank you for... Uh coming today and, and uh, just wanted to let you know um, the, um, if you've reviewed the, the stats I had included in the packet. Um, I find it very interesting how uh, we've rebounded obviously from last year uh, for June, July and August. And um, even though compared to numbers from 2019, uh, we are still, you know, we're, everything's robust. Um, it's just that um, some some things of I guess the the way to describe the numbers is that there are a lot of people here on the island, but a lot of them are now doing digital um, find you know um, finding things on their own, which um, leads me into the um, downloads from the website. Um, as you can tell um, from this that. Um, Things are still strong on that. Um, for June, um, the event list was up 982 from um, 700 in 2019. And also the travel and lodging brochure downloads were higher and the room lists um, are steady. And um, the same thing pretty much for um, July and August, if you can tell. I do want to talk about um, lodging in July um, and August. Um, as you probably have heard, we, and you can probably tell this, um, this summer has been very um, busy in terms of lodging. And from about mid-June to about mid-August, there were times where um, there were no rooms available overnight in the lodging association uh, group. Um, 
And if you allow me to do this um, from like July, the weekend of July 18th and 19th, there was only one location that had availability. And then the following weekend, uh, the tw June 25th and 26th, only two locations. Then by July 15th and 17th, um, we were sold out. And then again, July 29th to 31st, we were sold out and right through the next three weeks after that. Um, and then again, after um, then on like August 27th and 28th, we were sold out again. Um, it's interesting because um, one of the things that we keep track of are lodging inquiries when we get phone calls so that um, one of the one of the outstanding things in July was that on July 9th we had 49 calls that day looking for lodging, and then again um, in August we had on August 6 22 um, inquiries. It's just very interesting considering that um, there's a you know a lot of people here looking for places to stay, and of course the um, other things that the anecdotal stuff that you heard with the airport and the ferries. Um, so it just, it's just amazing how we've rebounded. Um, and I just think that um, we're, gonna, we're showing, we're seeing that we're having a strong September so far. Um, we had over, uh, we had a busy day on Monday um, and Mondays seem to be busy right now. Um, so I, I just, I, that's all I really wanted to tell you about that. Um, my other um, issue, not issue, but I just want to bring up that um, our staffing is uh, going to be less in later in September and October as we will be losing people to um, who are um, going back home. So our hours might be shorter and sometimes in October, but we will definitely be open over the Columbus Indigenous People Day weekend. Uh, we'll make sure to be open uh, for that uh, weekend as well. So um, I am happy to take any questions if anybody has any. Any questions for David? It's nice to see the numbers coming back. Yes. We all know that there were lots of people here. <laughs> yep. And, and th actually, uh, just to add, those days, I mean, those weekends that were not sold out, it was still like one or two properties. And, you know, the staff was shaking the trees, so to speak, by calling and emailing and making sure that, uh, you know, nobody was missed. Do you think some of it is a lack of inventory, too? That could be, because remember, um, a lot of places went, um, were sold and went private. But there's also Airbnb, VRBOs, all those are being um, taken as well. Um, and it's just no matter where you look on Nantucket, there there were a lot of people here this summer. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just I'm just always curious about the numbers as we lose guest houses that would have been on your list. Yeah, I mean there, no, there's so. roughly there's roughly about 800 uh, rooms still available online. I mean on you know yeah. but compared to maybe 25 years ago when there were about a thousand or so. Yeah, 1400 way back. Yeah. So, um, okay, any other questions for David? Okay, thank you. Um, moving along. I think Matt had uh, a question. Oh, Matt, sorry, missed you. Go ahead. Uh, David, has there been any reports of people not being able to find housing and camping out on the beach or anything like that? Not that we're aware of, and it's, you know, they, there's, camping is not allowed on the beach or anywhere. There's a fine for it, but we haven't heard anything about uh, people sleeping out on the beach or anything like that. Liz? Um, this really doesn't have much to do with you guys, but um, thank you for that information because um, I, I, I'm a little concerned because both the airport and of course the boats this year had issues uh, with last boats being canceled or planes being canceled. So I'm actually gonna probably end up doing some digging about stranded passengers because if we don't, if, if this is what's gonna be the new norm and we don't have anywhere to put people that are could be potentially stranded, 
um, anyway, just just as a little footnote, you know, just to be, uh, I'm going to be probably looking into that. See what yeah. we can do. Sarah? I just, I've, I've heard um, over the summer anecdotal stories about illegal camping and, and people, you know, um, little mini compounds that have been found. Um, if you're, if there's an interest in having some more of those numbers that I think talking to the land bank and the conservation foundation might be good because um, although they're, well, the land bank is, you know, town, but um, the private landowners individually those organizations often kind of break up those things so if there's an interest in understanding that i think and also i'm sure you've all heard about like the uber drivers that sleep in their cars and and in the parking lots that stop and shop and things like that so there's a lot of like that workforce piece not maybe not visitors but i think that then that's compounded so just a, a thought sharon no i i think this is a a real concern and i um, Liz, is there a formal committee that you're working with looking into emergency? No, no I just, uh, because I'm the one that has to deal with it, really, yeah. uh, just have been, you know, with the uh, situations that arose this summer, um, just going to be interested in kind of having some idea of you know if we can actually organize something to help people in in dire situations i don't think that there's really much available um, i think it has to be like a natural disaster in order to set up the high school so it you know anyway we'll see there might be there might be something to do with some of the ballrooms on island there's two big ballrooms in town oh well, that's true working with them to say if the town purchased cots and stuff and did something as emergency emergency services for either storm related or just you know david yeah. or just yeah saturated and some Jared, of that stuff here yeah let me add there was always a town emergency committee if you drove by the high school when we had the hurricane or the storm threat recently you saw the old van was in front and that was always stocked with supplies because, you know, in the winter, you'd hear about it opening up if Matic, had, you know, lost power and we had people that we had to move. But I don't know who is running that committee for the town anymore and what their resources are. But there was always a committee, always. So maybe that's something we should find out through um, Li Libby. Help. I'll help you. That would be awesome. Thank you. Okay, anything else? Um, I have to, I will tell you, I have to pop off in about three minutes. Um, I'm on a, a Zoom class from nine until one and I have to sign on ahead of time. So the last item on the discussion is topics to address for 21 and 22 into next year. Um, and maybe one of these things is stranded passengers. You know, that, that might be something to build some resources so that you know david and I would, janet i would be in favor of that and yeah I, I think stranded passengers is something we should put on our list to deal with this is a matter of knowing who connects with whom on an emergency basis because we're going to have jet blue flights that cannot leave at the end of the evening because of fog and they're going to disembark 90 passengers who are going to have a horrible experience if we don't have something in place so that should be on the list and then obviously the other things that we need to continue is how we're dealing with events. I mean, I think we need guidelines for that. And I think we need to understand what the town's going to do. Like Janet said, for outdoor dining, moving into next year, will that be continued? And um, I mean, I don't think we have the answers on that yet, but those would just be my suggestions. Sharon. It's just a personal thing that I would love the island to continue doing. And I think it's what Janet is always, and David are always pushing in the NHA. Um, I just feel like we've gotten very fancy and a lot of the character and to Matt's point, that old fashioned fun feel of Nantucket is sometimes getting lost with all the glitz and the glamor. And I would love an, another discussion maybe about how do we retain our charm as 
more money and more gentrification keeps pouring in here, what, what is, are there other things we can be doing um, in addition to our museums to continue to retain the charm? So just a thought. I just want to echo what Sharon said. I think that's a wonderful avenue for this group to kind of tackle. And as a representative of the conservation lands and outdoor space, I think adding that to the cultural component would be a really big asset. Matt? Yeah, and I completely agree as well. Uh, I mean, I think, unfortunately, with the turnover that we're seeing on this island, they're already losing most of the restaurants to bigger restaurant groups, and we've lost most of the ends to bigger hospitality groups. And so I think that this, I think that there's a large amount of investors almost in this place in the Hamptons that, you know, we, we can try to at least slow down for the time being. I think some of those are market forces over which any policy is not gonna have any control. Yeah, yeah I agree. Sarah, I didn't quite hear your last comment. Were you saying we should have a, conversation with some of the conservation uh, Oh, sorry. No, no, I was just kind of piggybacking on what Sharon was saying about um, as part of the character is encouraging the discussion of the conservation lands and open space as part of that cultural heritage. And that could involve talking to the different conservation leaders. Um, but also uh, kind of Sideline, I, I've been involved for a number of years in the Island Fair, and I think um, that is to, to the point that was made earlier, another festival that really celebrates the kind of local island character. And so any way that this group can support endeavors like that to make it easier or smoother. I know like the Egan Maritime used to do the Maritime Festival, and that really kept that maritime tradition alive um, in the shoulder season. And was, you know, so I know those are other groups events, but those free fun events that are celebrate the character, it'd be nice to see how we can um, support those kind of endeavors. Some of the old history to life. I just yeah. remember like the, the Nantucket Looms did like the spinning wheels when I was a kid. There was candle making demonstrations. There was just so many crafty demonstrations about what life was like here trying to survive and when we didn't have Amazon delivering everything. It's just really interesting. Okay, any other comments for Jana? And we can work on building a schedule in the next uh, few weeks as to how we may approach things through the spring of 22, which is hard to believe. Any other discussion? Hey, Janet, anything else? Uh, no, that's it. Thank you. Okay, then I'll ask for a uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Thank you all for joining. We are only missing Josh this morning, and he was traveling, so I appreciate Good to see you all back after our okay. summer hiatus. Bye-bye. Good work, okay. everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Amen. Janet. Bye-bye. David? Mm -hmm. I'm on mute. Sorry.